Somebody said that everything that have breath, amen, praise the Lord. We bless the Lord this morning in Jesus' name, and we welcome you to the last day's church in the city of Nashville with yours truly, Pastor T.W. Bell and the last day's church family. Certainly, we are thanking God. We are blessing God, and we are giving God praise this morning for the privilege and the opportunity to be able to come together and to worship God in spirit and in truth. Amen. Somebody said that this is the day that the Lord has made. So we are rejoicing and we are glad in it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We bless the Lord this morning in Jesus' name for his goodness, for his kindness, for his mercy, for his love, for his grace, for his favor. Somebody said that if I had 10,000 tongues, I couldn't praise him enough. I couldn't bless him enough. So we bless God this morning in Jesus' name. And before... Amen. We can go any further. We would like to go before the Lord 
with a word of prayer in Jesus' name. And so this morning, we are touching and agreeing with you. We are touching and agreeing that God is going to open doors, that God is going to make a way, amen, that he's going to send healing, that he's going to send a word of healing to your home, to your heart, to your house. We're believing that God is going to work a work this morning. We're believing that the crooked places are going to be made straight. And we believe that God is going to bring every high place down and exalt every low place in your life. Amen. So we're blessing God this morning in Jesus' name. And we know that there are a lot of people this morning that are going through, that are dealing with uh, bereavement because they've lost a loved one. They've lost someone and they haven't been able to uh, uh, grieve properly. So we want to pray for all families that are dealing with bereavement, whether it's COVID related or not. We want to pray that God would bless, that God would touch. We want to pray in Jesus' name uh, for the closeness of our families, that during these times that God would draw our families closer together because it's in times like these that we need each other in Jesus' name. And so we're believing God this morning. We're believing God in Jesus' name for the families that stand in jeopardy this morning. It might not be you, but it could have been you. Amen. There's a lot of families that are standing in jeopardy. They don't know how they're going to make it. They don't know how uh, the rent is going to be paid, the mortgage is going to be paid, or how they're going to feed the children. But we're going to pray this morning that God will speak to the ravens and that the ravens will begin flying towards their house in Jesus' name. We believe in that God is going to make a way, that God is going to do it. And as always, we pray for our president, for kings, for those that are in authority. We pray for prime ministers, for governors, for mayors, for chiefs of police. We pray for everybody that's in authority in Jesus' name, that they would make the proper decisions, that their hearts would be moved towards humanity and not just money. And we're just believing, God, that this morning you're going to be blessed. And, and by chance you, you don't feel blessed, and by chance you don't feel yourself, I'm prophesying to you right now that by the time this broadcast is over, you're going to worship God. You're going to lift him up. You're going to give him glory in Jesus' name. And so right now, these are hands that believe that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above what we ask to think according to the power that's working in us and the power is working. We believe that God is going to do it this morning in Jesus' name. So with that said, with that done, I ask you, to bow your heads with me in Jesus' name as we go before the Lord with a word of prayer in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Father, now, in the name of Jesus, as we come before you, we give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor, we bless you, we love you, we lift you up, we magnify you, we worship you, and we exalt you because you and you alone are worthy of praise. You are worthy of thanksgiving. And God, this morning in Jesus' name, we say thank you. Hallelujah. We say thank you, Lord. We, we say thank you, Lord, because you are so good, because you've done so much. And God, we cannot hold our peace. God, this morning, we offer up the fruit of our lips to sacrifice and praise. We give you glory and honor because you've been so good. You brought us from a mighty long way. We thank you for that. This morning in Jesus' name, hallelujah. As we come, God, we set the atmosphere on worship. We set the atmosphere on praise, God. We set the atmosphere, and we make it conducive for you to move, oh God. And we declare right now that any way you want to bless us, that we'll be satisfied this morning in the name of Jesus. So have your way, God. Remember, our God, those that are listening, those that are tuned in, God, around the country and the world, God, we pray that you touch them, that you strengthen them, that you bless them, and we pray that every yoke would be broken, and that every heavy burden would be lifted, oh God. And we believe in you this morning more specifically for the families, oh God, that are grieving, for those that have lost a loved one, for those that have heavy feelings this morning, oh God, because they've had to bury some. We, we pray, God, right now that you be a very present help in the time of trouble. We pray that you be the God of comfort, the God of mercy, the God of strength, but more so the God of peace. Do it right now. In Jesus' name, and we pray for those that are in positions of authority. We pray for the president, for kings. We pray for mayors, for governors. We pray for all of those that are making decisions right now, that the decisions, oh God, will be guided by your hand. We understand that the king's heart 
is in your hand and that you can turn it. And so now, God, we even ask you for our children. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name that our children are able to be vaccinated. And we just pray now that, God, you would move among young people in Jesus' name, that you would draw them with loving kindness and with tender mercies. And according to your word, you have ordained perfect praise out of the mouths of babes and sons. So this morning we thank you. This morning we love you. This morning we bless you. This morning we lift you up. This morning we glorify you. Hallelujah. We honor you. Hallelujah. We bless your wonderful name. That we prepare to worship you this morning in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So God, we say thank you to you. And we ask you to have your way as we prepare to worship you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We just thank you, Lord. We just thank you. We bless God because we believe. We believe right now. That there are those that are tuned in, that there are those that are listening, that God is going to bless you, that God is going to strengthen you, that God is going to touch you. And I want to take this moment and this opportunity to officially welcome you to the last day's church in the city of Nashville. Hallelujah. Music City USA. We are giving God praise. We are giving God glory. And, and we welcome you, amen, to the liberty that's found from being in God's presence. In the presence of the Lord, there is liberty. Um, and we, we, we welcome you into that liberty this morning. You're free to worship. You're free to dance. You're free to shout. You're free to lift your hands. Whatever you need to do, do it in Jesus' name. And, and I say this to you, because you've thought about, so much about us, we've thought about you, and I prophesy, and I guarantee you today that by the, by the time we finish, that you're going to be above and not from beneath. That by the time we finish, you ought to be ready to run over some troops and leap over some walls. That your heart is going to be stirred because you thought so much about us. We thought so much about you. And so this morning, in Jesus' name, we welcome you. In Jesus' name, and let me just prepare you. In Jesus' name, you ought to be here next week. You ought to be here next week. Yes. Oh, you ought to be here next week. Yes. The last day church is opening back up. Amen. On November the 7th at 11 a.m. And we are coming with our heavy boots on. We're coming to give God praise. We're coming to give God glory. Oh, I wish somebody would give him a praise right now. We're coming to give God honor in the wonderful name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So meet us here next Sunday in Jesus' name. So right now, I want you to prepare yourself to worship as the praise team comes and lead us in a song of worship. Let's receive them by saying amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We come to tell God, hallelujah, we thank you, Jesus, for the victory, no matter what the circumstances is. We still have the victory in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, 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 oh,
Give the Lord some glory. Let's give the Lord some glory. Let's give the Lord some honor. Hallelujah. He is a risen king. Come on, let's worship right now. Come on, let's worship right now. Come on, let's magnify our God right now. Come on, let's glorify our God right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Death couldn't hold him down. He is a risen king. Hallelujah. And he's seated in majesty, yes. seated in dominion, seated in glory, yes. seated in power. Hallelujah. We bless God this morning. Oh, I wish I had a worshiper. I wish I had a worshiper in here. I wish I had a worshiper. Somebody don't care, but nobody think of care, but nobody got to say. All you know is that if had that people of the Lord who was on your side, you wouldn't have made it where you are today. You wouldn't be where you are today. And for that, you got to say thank you. For that, you got to give God glory. For that, you've got to give God honor. We worship God this morning. 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 We worship Him. Hallelujah. He is worthy. He's worthy of praise. He's worthy of glory. Worthy of honor. Hallelujah. I don't, I don't know how people can live without him in their lives. I wouldn't want to live. I, I told God last night, I said, I'm locked in, Lord. I said, there ain't no other life for me to live but the life that I live before you now by the faith of the Son of God. 
We bless God in Jesus' name. And amen. I pray that you're ready to worship with the last day's church. We thank God for you in Jesus' name. We, we understand that you had a lot of choices this morning. But we bless God that you chose to be with us. And I'm going to mess with you a little bit. I want to tell you this. God chose before you chose. Hallelujah. So God has ordained that you be here with us in this moment. And we certainly bless the Lord. We are going to turn our hearts towards the word of God this morning. Because man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And certainly we thank God that God speaks to us and gives us a preceding word. Certainly we bless God in Jesus' name. And I don't take for granted God speaking uh, speaking to me in Jesus' name. I've come to value it. And so sometimes even in this subtle estate, a couple of weeks ago, very quickly, a couple of weeks ago, I was leaving and getting ready to go to another place of business. And, and God slowed me down and he told me to turn around and go take some keys back. And I turned around and I took the keys back. I listened to God and I took the keys back. And so then after I dropped the keys off, I turned around and I drove to where I was trying to go. And right at my destination, there was what I call a bullwinkle bull. There was, a, I mean, a deer. There was a deer. I'm talking about he was bigger than my car. He had antlers and the whole nine yards. And he was 10 seconds in front of my car. If I had not have turned around and slowed down, I would have been 10 seconds further. So what I'm saying is sometimes you never know what God is delivering you from. You need to listen. Amen. So we thank God. We thank God. But I want you this morning to grab your Bibles. And we are getting ready to go into the word of the Lord in Jesus' name. And we, we thank God in Jesus' name. Amen. For live worship, we thank God in Jesus' name. Hallelujah for getting ready to come back into the sanctuary. We bless God in Jesus' name. We really do. And so this morning, I'm going to ask you to grab your Bibles and to grab your uh, notebook or your iPad or your Galaxy Note or whatever you have. And before we go further, can everybody in here just say hallelujah? hallelujah. Come on, give me a, a sanctified church hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Amen. This morning, we find ourselves in a unique position because the world is celebrating Halloween. Amen. Amen. But I want to celebrate something greater than Halloween. I want to celebrate the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I want to celebrate that. And so this morning, I, I, I got a treat for you. Amen. Somebody might feel like it's a trick. <laughs> it's not. Get your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter number three. And I have been trying to be terse and brief on how much I read, but I got to get contextual truth. So I'm only going to read one scripture right now, but I'll give you the context and the setting of it momentarily. Genesis chapter number three. And I want to just look at the 13th verse. Genesis 3 and 13. And it reads, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Let me read 
that again in Jesus' name for those of you that are just tuning in and catching up. Genesis chapter 3, verse 13. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And this morning, in Jesus' name, I want to share this with you. I tried to get out from under it, but I couldn't. The Lord dropped his heart in my heart and suspended me with this thought. And I want to share this with you. The devil's trick, God's trick. Oh, I wish somebody would catch a lie, come alive, and grab a hold of that. The devil's trick oftentimes becomes God's treat. Hallelujah. Father, as this word prepares to go out, we bless you, we love you, we praise you. We pray, God, right now for clarity and articulation of thought. We pray that your word, God, would go forth without any reservation, that it would be as the hammer that breaks the rocks into pieces. Allow it in Jesus' name to fall on good ground, good hearts, that it might germinate bud and bring forth. As you say, the water and the rain is, let the word be. Let it come down from heaven, oh God, and cause right now the earth to be watered in Jesus' name. We thank you, and we do love you in Jesus' name. Amen. The devil's trick, God's treat. As I said, the world is celebrating Halloween. And children are anticipating nightfall today because they are going out trying to get some treats. And I don't kill Halloween from that perspective because children have a pure desire. They just want some candy. But because Halloween falls on a Sunday this year, I found it fitting to talk on this subject of what has become transmuted to a certain degree. And I say transmuted because Halloween wasn't always is what it is today. But I also have to tell you that even its history and its roots didn't start out well. And that's why for those of us who call ourselves born-again Christians, those of us who say that we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, we need to be very cautious out as to how we involve ourselves and adhere to the observation of this pagan ritual. So let me give you a little bit of history about Halloween. It is not something that is new. As a matter of fact, the history of Halloween is over 2,000 years old. It has been around for quite some time. In its infantile stage and in its fundamental development, it was the Celtic festival that is known as Samhain, which means summer's end. And so we celebrate Halloween at the end of summer. Summer has gone and Indian summer has passed. And so we're in that season where the end of the summer is upon us. But this Celtic festival had its origin in Ireland and it got a sure foundation in England or in the UK. And it's been around for quite some time. 
And what they used to do is during the festival of Samhain, they would start bonfires and dress up. And the reason that they would dress up is because they thought dressing up will ward off ghosts and evil spirits. And so here again, in its fundamental element, there, there are some things that, that I don't believe that a true saint of God ought to be involved in. Right. And you can say uh, what you want. It's tight, but it's right. Hallelujah. Yeah. And so they used to dress up and start bonfires. And the other thing was is that the, through the history and the morphing, the changing of Halloween, because it started as a Celtic thing and and then it began to get footing over in England and, and over in the UK. And so uh, the church got involved. And you know how oftentimes anything that is attractive and anything uh, that sometimes has monetary value connected to it, uh, the secular church will always get involved to try to make it benefit uh, whatever their objective is. So the secular church got involved and they used to celebrate what was called uh, Saint's Eve or you've heard of Hallow's Eve, which means a hallowed evening. Uh, but the church got involved and they put some things in it and they kept some of the pagan rituals. And that's what's wrong today is oftentimes we allow the enemy to sneak in because we are so busy trying to do what the world does, that we are not uh, attentive spiritually to what God is doing and what the enemy is trying to trick us with. I ah, praise the name of our God, but I serve notice on the devil today that we will not be true, that we will not be fooled by your ploy and by your plot. Ah, God, and so it became known as hollow evening. Uh -huh. And so what happened in Ireland is that in Ireland, during the 1800s, uh, they started to have what was known as a potato famine, a potato shortage. And so what happened is, is you had a lot of people that began to leave Ireland and move to this Hesperia, to the Western Hemisphere. They begin to come to this part of the world. And when they begin to move to this part of the world, they brought all of uh, 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 their festive festivals with them. They brought all of their celebrations with them. They brought all of their traditions with them, one of them being Halloween. And so uh, they, be they begin to move to the United States. And, and that was in the 1800s that you had a great migration from Ireland into the United States because of a potato, a potato fat. But it, was, it wasn't until 1920 in the United States that Halloween began to get a sure footing. And so uh, I don't have time to go through all of it, but I hope that was enough history for me. So what I want you to understand is, is this, is because it wasn't always originally children. It used to be people that would dress up and go around to homes and they would either ask for money or for food to try to make it. And so, as I said, through our morphing and through this changing, it has become what it is now where children come and knock on your door and say, trick or treat. And I'm going to make you laugh because I used to live in a different neighborhood about a year or so ago. And there were a lot of children in the neighborhood that were of foreign descent. Uh -huh. And a lot of them, amen, they love Halloween. So because all they knew is, is that if I knock on the door, that I'm going to get some candy. So what happened is, these children were of Arab descent. They didn't understand Halloween and all the other holidays that we had. So on Thanksgiving, my doorbell rings. And when I go to the door, these little kids say, trick or treat on Thanksgiving. <laughs> because all they know is it's a holiday and we ought to be able to get some candy. 
So what we're going to do, or what we, we often do, is we often just give the kids some candy at church. Amen? Amen. So now, so now, now it's transitioned, it's morphed, it's changed. But I want to bring you to our scripture text, and I got to move, I got to move, I got to bring you to our scripture text. And in Genesis chapter number three, you understand that this is the historical and biblical account of the fall of Adam and Eve. And, and the three primary characters are Adam, Eve, and the devil. And so, oh my God, I want you to understand something that, yes, Halloween has over a 2,000 year history, but I want to let you in on, on something that the enemy has been tricking people since the dawn of man. Ah, but the devil, amen, ought to be nervous because what he used to trick us, God is going to turn it into our truth. Hallelujah to the Lamb. So, as we begin to look at Genesis chapter number 3, you know in verse 13, 13 is where God begins to cross-examine the woman and ask her, what is it that thou hast done? But she said something to God. She said that the enemy, uh -huh, that he beguiled me. Mm -hmm. And she uses the Hebrew word nas nasha. It is N-A-S-A-A. -A -A. And it means to lead a strength. It means to delude. And it means to seduce. And I want to tell you something. That the enemy, the devil, is good at seducing people. He is good at leading people astray from the truth. And this is why we need to be on top of our game in these last days because we are living in a time where there are seducing spirits that are everywhere trying to trick the people of God. Ah, the devil, I sort of notice on you that your trick ain't going to work. Oh, I wish somebody would give God a praise right now. So I recognized it, that he begounded her, he tricked her, he led her astray from what God had told her to be true. And, 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 and I don't want to kill Adam, but I see him, it makes me mad, because Adam puts up no resistance to what Eve offers him. And I want to tell you, brother, just because your wife said it's all right, don't make it all right. I want to tell you, sister, just because your husband said it's okay to do it, you can't be tricked by what the enemy is saying. You got to stand on what God has said. Oh, I wish I had a witness in this house that would clap their hands and give our God a praise. I praise the name of our God. And so we must understand that this is the story of the account of the falling. But in order to understand the devil's trickery, we got to go to the beginning of the chapter. The Bible says it like this. Ah, my God, in chapter 1, in verse 1 of chapter 3 of the book of Genesis, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle. I caught the any beast of the field uh, which the Lord had made. Uh -huh. And I want you to underline that word subtle. Uh -huh. uh, uh, God, that is the Hebrew term around. And it is spelled A R U M. It means to be crafty. It means to be shrewd. And it means to be sensible. So you got to understand that the devil that we are dealing with, that he is crafty, that he is shrewd, and that he is sensible. And as I begin, oh my God, to think about sensible, we are not talking about sensible in the sense, oh my God, that he is wise or in the sense that he uses that. What it is is, he is attentive to your senses. Uh, he is sensible. You got to understand something. This is how he uses your senses to trick you. He is sensible. So he puts something in front of your eye. He makes you smell something. Oh, uh, y'all ain't saying nothing. He is sensible. I want you to understand something. He wants you to taste something. He wants you to taste something because I understand that we are in the world, but we are not of the world, but we are connected to the world by our senses. Oh my God. But right now, I ask God 
to desensitize me to anything that will pull me away. Desensitize me from anything that will take my heart away from you. Oh God, somebody clap your hands and tell our God thank you. Oh God, so he's sensible. So you know the story. I got to move. I got to move. You know the story. That he began to talk to the woman. And he said in verse uh, one, uh, uh, one, he said unto the woman, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Have God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Mm -hmm. So he poses a statement that has the trickery of doubt in it. Yes. Yeah, have God said. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and the woman said in verse 2 unto the servant, we can eat of all the fruit of the garden, the trees of the garden, but three. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God is saying, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Here is where the first trick comes in. All right, come on now. And the serpent said, tell somebody, stop listening to snakes talk. I wish I had a witness in this house. Stop listening to snakes talk. Hold on to what God has said. Hold on to what God has spoken. Hold on to what God has shown. The serpent said, ye shall not surely Lord have mercy. You should not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then shall your eyes be open. They weren't blind. Not naturally. See, they are in what we call the dispensation of innocence. They have not seen. They have not known sin. They have not known what was wrong. And that's when the devil wants to do his most trickery. <clears throat> when you're innocent. Amen. Hallelujah. That's why we got to pray over our children. Yes. That's why we got to anoint them with oil. And we got to put the word of God in them yes. while they are young. Why does the Bible tell you? Train up a child in the way he should go. Yes. The problem we got on our hands is a bunch of untrained children. Amen. Well, God. He says, for God doth know that in the day you eat, your eyes are going to be open. You should be as gods, knowing good and knowing evil. The devil's tree becoming God's tree. Mm. Look at this. Look at this. And the eyes are open. Look at it. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Bear with me. Verse 6, I got to get this. Can I tell you this? The devil can't trick you until he's done surveillance on you. Amen. Oh, God. The devil can't get you until he's watched you. See, see, he has to watch you in order to identify what it is that you're attracted to. He's got to watch you to identify what it is that he can present to you in order to trick you. He watched her in the garden. Yes, the Bible says he was crafty. He was subtle. He was subtle. He was wrong the Hebrew term. He was crafty. So he watched her. He was sensible. What did he do? He watched her eyes lit up when she got near that tree. He watched how the hair on her arms stood up when she got close to that tree. Just like he watches you when that butter pecan brother pull up in that Mercedes at the gas station. Oh, God. I ain't even going to say it. Just like he watches you, brother, to see what intrigues you. So, Paul, you got to understand this. You are being watched. You are under surveillance. 
Because the enemy cannot attack you until he has done surveillance on you. Ah, God, let me move real quick. So, look at what the Bible said. And when the woman saw that the tree was good, look at this. The Bible tells us that there are three things in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Doesn't the Bible teach that? Look, you're going to see these three things right here. Look at what happened. And when the woman saw, verse 6, that the tree was good for food, that's the lust of the flesh. Did you see it? Uh-huh. And then that it was pleasant to the eyes. That's the lust of the eye. Do you see? Hallelujah. And then he said this. A tree desired to make one wise. Everybody want to be wise. That's the pride of life. Everybody wants to get there. Look at this. She took the fruit. Oh, tell somebody, don't take the fruit. Don't take the fruit. Don't take the fruit. All fruit ain't good. And I want to let you in on the secret. Everything that we call fruit ain't fruit. Mm. A tomato is not a vegetable. Mm -hmm. It's a fruit. Mm -hmm. But we've been tricked into thinking that it's a vegetable. Oh, God. So look at this. So let's move. Let's move. So you know the the thing, they sinned, they failed, they came up short. And and when they came up short, the Bible said that their eyes were open. Now, this was their eyes of consciousness. They were conscious. They were no longer innocent. They were conscious to the fact of their nakedness. <clears throat> and when you're innocent, nakedness don't bother you. It's when you're conscious that you want to cover up. <laughs> right now, you got babies running around the house with drawers on there. You worried about it? <laughs> it's when they start getting five and four, they start recognizing that they're different than him, that they're different from her. They become conscious. And what do they do? They want to cover up. They covered up themselves. But can I tell you this? Can I tell you this? You can't cover up your sin with fig leaves. Amen. You can't cover up your sin with fig leaves. I ain't going to finish today. I'm going to do part two in Jesus' name. Let me go. So the Bible says this. Ah, God. The devil's trick, God's trick. Now, now, now. I want you to understand. The Bible says this. And the Lord said to the woman, what you have? What have you done? She said, the serpent beguiled in me. Uh-huh. He led me astray. He deluded. He seduced me. And this is why it is so important for us not to let our guards down. It is so important for us to get to the place where we understand how the enemy operates. Because oftentimes, if we don't understand how the enemy operates, he can fool us. He can trick us. Uh, God, y'all got to understand. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. What the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us in, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 2 and verse number 11 that we ought not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. Come on, somebody, say hallelujah. That we ought not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. And why should we be ignorant of his devices? He puts it like this. Oh, God, 2 and 11, 2 Corinthians. Uh, we cannot be ignorant of his devices. And the reason is, is that he will get the advantage over us. And we don't need to be tricked by the devil because we won't pay attention to how he operates and how he works. The Bible teaches us that we ought to be sober and we ought to be diligent. Why? Because our adversary is as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. Oh uh, my God, but I want y'all to understand that while the devil is watching me, I'm watching him. Y'all ain't saying nothing. While the devil is surveilling me, I'm surveilling what he does. Oh uh, God, why do you think the Bible says that we ought to be wise as a serpent, but harmless as a dove? We need to understand how he works. We need to understand how he functions. And I want you to get something else here that a lot of church people don't get. A lot of church people don't understand what 2 Corinthians chapter 11 our God in the 14th verse said. It says, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed 
transformed into an angel of light. And they used the, the Greek term to you. They mean don't, don't wonder, don't marvel that Satan puts on a, a, a costume. Did y'all catch that? That Satan puts on a costume. He dresses up trying to trick you to make you think that he what he's not. Oh my God, I wish I had a witness in this house. It says marvel not that he is transformed. Let me hit you with this Greek term. Oh God, metaschematizo. Metaschematizo. It means to transfigure and it means to disguise himself. So oftentimes he disguises himself as an angel of light. Oh God, hallelujah. And he's tricked the world. He's tricked people. He's tricked kings. He's tricked people in the door. But right now, I'm jumping a tree. I want you to know that what the devil used to trick us, God is going to use to trick us. What the devil used to mess us up, God is going to use to bless us up. Oh, I wish I had a witness in this house. What the devil did, yes, he messed up. Yes, how oh God, he tricked humanity. Yes, how oh God, he did a lot of things. But I want you to understand something. That there comes a time, oh God, and I'm jumping the fence right now. There comes a time when God turns the tables on the devil. There comes a time when God takes the tables and turns them around. And that's what he's about to do. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you be. I don't know what you're bound by. But I'm telling you right now, your bondage is getting ready to turn into liberty. I'm telling you, your depression is getting ready to turn into joy. I'm telling you right now that your prison is getting ready to become a stage for your praise. God is getting ready to open some door. God is getting ready to preach you. I may not finish all of this, but I want to share this with you. When the devil tempted Jesus, the trick was he posed the question of doubt, which is how he tricks us. If you be the son of God, hmm. just like you, if God really loved you, you wouldn't be going through this. If you were really saved, you wouldn't have to deal with this. The devil is a liar. I am the son of God. And because I am a son of God, sometimes I gotta go through the valley. But I understand that he's in the valley with me. The trick is, he, listen, he offered Jesus the kingdoms of this world. And the trick is, often he offers you what you going to get anyway. But he just tries to edit the process. Yes. Oh, God. Mm, come on. But we ain't fooled by it. Yeah. We ain't fooled at all. Let me move. Let me move. Let me move. I want you to understand something. That God turned a trick on the devil. You say, Pastor Bill, how did he do that? I ain't got time to go through all of it, but just very quickly. How did he do that? Jesus said when he first comes on the scene, he said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. Mm. So Jesus put the bait out there for the devil. Go ahead, kill me. But if you kill me, I'm going to raise this temple back up in three days. Now, how is that trick become our truth? I ain't got time to go through it. But the Bible says if they had known who he was, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Mm. They didn't know who he was. They didn't know what he was going to do. But when they killed him, they gave him access to the lower parts. <laughs> Y'all saying, Pastor, you just said I ain't got time to go through it. 
Peter says that the righteous man was killed for the unrighteous and said that when he died, he went to the, the lower parts of hell and preached to the spirits that was in prison. That's what the Bible says. But when he got up, this is where the truth comes. When I get up, I'm getting up with all power and heaven and open in my hand. And when I get up, everybody that's down is getting up with me. Oh my God, every drunk, every drunk, every girl is going to be. She getting up with me. What was a tree has now become a tree. I'm going to say this. Let me say this and I'm going to quit. The vices that the enemy used to turn us out. God used them to bring us in. Amen. Amen. The vices that the enemy used to turn you out, God has used them to bring you in. I was running from my addiction because the devil had tricked me. I didn't know that the first hit was going to cost me 10 years. I didn't know that the first drink was going to cost me 20 years, just like you didn't know. It was a trick from the devil. But here comes the trick. Because when you started running from your addiction, is when you ran straight into God. When you started running from your abuse and your shame, is when you found God. And what used to have us bound, now, we stand and live it. The devil's tree became God's tree. He said, Pastor, how can you say that? Because such for some of us that we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. God bless you. I pray that this message has helped you. I pray that it has encouraged you. And I pray that you will no longer be ignorant to the devil's devices. No longer be susceptible to his beguiling. And let me say something very, very quickly. Preachers sometimes, even myself, are guilty of this. Sometimes we want to go too deep. And we want to study theology. And we, we want to talk about uh, theory and theology. And all of these different things. And they have their place. But the Bible te tells us. That as Satan beguiled Eve, he doesn't want our minds to be beguiled, tricked from the simplicity of the gospel. The simplicity of the gospel is this. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. It's that simple. It brings upon other things, but it's simplicity. And sometimes we go too deep. We try to give you all these theories and these theologies. And the simplicity is, is faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. The devil's tree is now God's tree. I love you. God bless you. And if this broadcast has been a blessing to you, if this message has touched you in any way, I ask you right now, Sow a seed into ministry with us in Jesus' name. And I tell you, this is not trickery. This is nothing to do with getting ahead. Amen. I'm very well gatefully employed. This is for ministry's sake. That the gospel continues to get out. That we continue to be a church, a city that is set on a hill. Sow a seed right now, right now. Sow a seed. Go to lastdayschurch.org. You can go to Givelify. You can look for Last Days Church in the city of Nashville, and you can sow a seed, no matter what it is, $50, $500, $5,000. Amen. Sow that seed of faith and know that if you give and if you sow, that God will open windows of heaven, that God will cause men to give into your bosom. How? Press down, shaking together, and running over. So, so this morning, we love you. And as always, myself and Dr. Bell, we miss you. And the Last Days Church family, we're looking forward to you coming to be with us. Come be with us next week as we open back up and we worship God in spirit and in truth. God bless you until next time.